I would imagine that most of you don't know who um, the China Britain Business Council is. We're essentially the UK uh, organisation that uh, really exists to help UK businesses uh, do business in China. Um, so we're a membership organisation. Uh, we're not part of government, but we work very closely with the UK, uh, the UK trade and investment in the UK to provide support for exporters across all sectors, actually. And we work a lot with um, uh, businesses in the retail consumer space, uh, as well as those targeting Chinese tourists, um, but across a whole spectrum of industries from healthcare through to finance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the scope of our activities is quite wide. Um, and increasingly, we're working with brands that are looking to sell into the market, on a, into the China market on a cross-border basis. Um, and particularly small, medium-sized enterprises. Um, I mean, we've heard from Clarins and um, uh, other major brands here that obviously have a major um, uh, 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 presence in China. Um, but actually, China for, for, for smaller companies, uh, actually, it can be quite uh, a lot more challenging than for those big players. So we work with them to provide practical support and assistance. So um, I'm going to run through, we don't have too much time, and I'm conscious that um, lunch is approaching very quickly. Um, so um, I wanted to start just by comparing, actually, the, the China e-commerce landscape with the UK. Obviously, the two markets are, uh, we've heard today just about how different the Chinese ecosystem is uh, compared to the, the UK. And I think it's worth sort of highlighting, although we've seen these big numbers and, um, you know, 688 million internet users, I think 40 million new internet users this year, uh, and then the numbers and the growth in China are breathtaking. But at the same time, China is a relatively immature market in terms of the consumer. The fact, I mean, we just heard that a lot of those new mobile users are in tier three, tier four cities, a lot of growth in rural areas. So actually those consumers are, they don't necessarily have the same familiarity with um, overseas brands and with e-commerce as um, UK consumers do. By comparison, the UK is a very mature e-commerce marketplace. Um, I mean, we have uh, for about 45 million internet users. Penetration is 86% of the adult population. And overall, um, you know, although we're sort of, uh, you know, a, a fraction of the size of the overall number of Chinese internet users, the e-commerce market itself is, you know, maybe, maybe China is five or six times bigger. Um, so in terms of spending per capita, um, we're talking 3,000 plus euros per annum for the, uh, as an average for UK consumer spending online. Um, and it's still growing very fast. We're also seeing that, that migration to mobile. Um, but actually, China, uh, UK does have a very sophisticated um, infrastructure. It's a real centre for tech innovation um, uh, around, te around technology, uh, payment. Obviously, the fact that London is one of the uh, uh, fashion capitals of Europe and a finan key financial centre means that there's a lot of expertise there that we're able to, uh, to, to really um, uh, 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 take advantage of. Um, what that means really is that for retailers and brands, they're very comfortable within that environment, within the UK environment, trading uh, across the platforms that they're familiar with. Um, a lot of them have developed their own solutions. Um, and if you look at sort of the, who the key players are in the UK compared to China, um, it's pretty much dominated by um, omnichannel retailers, by high street retailers, by people like Tesco, Nex, uh, M&S, John Lewis, etc. Um, compare that to China, and it's you know we know that it's complete. The e-commerce market is completely dominated by e-marketplaces. Um, clearly, Tmall, JD being being the biggest, um, but obviously a, a plethora of um, category uh, vertical platforms as well. Um, so for UK brands, particularly for smaller retailers that maybe um, they're very familiar with with Amazon, you know, think about half of. British retailers sell via Amazon. China is a very difficult market to, to initially just to understand the ecosystem and the landscape. Um, what do these platforms look like? How, do, how can they get established on them? Uh, particularly for SMEs. 
um, the time and the cost involved in actually setting up a presence so that they can set up a Tmall store and set up a, a, a JD.com store. Um, similar to WeChat, all of these domestic platforms require local presence in market. Fine for Clarence if you've got thousands of people employed in China to run the business, but for a smaller company looking to break into the market for the first time, a lot more challenging. And in fact, many of the major retail, um, the big retail players in, in the UK have really struggled in China. So the likes of M&S, ASOS, uh, significantly over-invested in, in China. And so I think that that's kind of, it's led to a degree of caution developing with UK brands retailers. There's a lot of, um, even some of the um, more high profile uh, high street brands have taken a much more measured approach to the China market because they see it as quite a risky environment to do business in. Um, I, I sort of, um, I suppose it, uh, ironically, given that uh, caution of UK brands, um, the Chinese consumer are actually very much attracted by UK uh, brands. Um, this, um, these statistics came from a recent survey of um, uh, Chinese consumers. Um, and um, it showed that sort of two thirds of Chinese consumers were likely to purchase goods or services from a British hosted e-commerce website. Um, so the UK ranks very high in terms of the um, uh, the most desired destinations for um, shoppers looking at cross-border, uh, shoppers in China looking to purchase from overseas um, websites. It ranks sixth uh, after the US, Japan, Korea, Germany and Australia. So it's, do it's doing quite well there. Um, and actually e cross-border e-commerce, maybe it's the fact that we're an island and we're part of the European Union, so um, the for now at least, <laughs> um, the, uh, being, being part of that um, a small country within a larger European market means that we've had to develop cross-border e-commerce, it's just part of our, of our DNA really. Um, but obviously China is a very different um, proposition. Um, I think what we tend to find is that most UK retailers are not particularly well set up to cater to Chinese uh, shoppers. I think that less than half UK retailers actually offer China as a destination market for shipping. Of those, about one in, one in ten actually has Mandarin as an option, and I think that less than 3% actually will pre-calculate duties and customs and shipping costs. Um, so actually, coming back to the, uh, the way that we, um, uh, the, the experience that we're offering to Chinese consumers, I think that um, there's still a long way to go for a lot of uh, British retailers to actually cater to that Chinese talk, uh, that Chinese consumer, be it the cross-border shopper or the, uh, the the Chinese tourists that we have coming uh, coming to visit the UK. Um, another uh, survey, another I think this was a YouGov um, recent survey looking at perceptions of British brands. I think this is another major challenge uh, for brands targeting the Chinese consumer. Um, we're comparing UK with Germany, Chinese perceptions of UK are quite different. So the UK tends to be perceived as being quite a traditional country. Um, the words traditional, stylish uh, uh, score quite highly, compared to a country like Germany where the products are considered to be um, high quality, maybe more innovative. A lot of British brands, particularly the, uh, the more modern, quirky, fashionable brands, they like to see themselves as being very creative and, and um, uh, you know, modern. And that's not necessarily how um, China views us. In fact, the UK, uh, if we think of top of mind brands with Chinese consumers, it's Burberry, a traditional luxury British brand. It's Rolls Royce and it's Bentley. Chinese consumers not being aware that Rolls Royce and Bentley are actually owned by German companies. But obviously those, um, those brand associations are very, very strong. Who are the well-known figures? It's, yes, David Beckham, but it's Winston Churchill and the Queen. Um, so I think that um, when targeting Chinese consumers, it's, it's very important to actually understand how they perceive us and maybe build our products and uh, marketing strategies that actually take that into account. Maybe emphasising the traditional elements of those 
um, of, our, of our products, maybe changing the messaging um, to align it more with, the, with those stereotypes, effectively, of the UK. And we tend to find that those um, more traditional British brands seem to be seeing more success in China than maybe the, the more modern, quirky, quirky types of brands. Obviously, um, that's something which is reinforced by the media and the type of images that uh, Chinese consumers uh, see through the media. Um, I've been talking to a few of you in the networking session and, and we were chatting about the importance of brand ambassadors and key opinion leaders. And what better key opinion leader can you have than um, Xi Dada, um, who, who visited the UK in, um, uh, in, in November, big state visit, we rolled out the red carpet, he spent time with the Queen. Um, and it clearly that, and that tradition, that British, that kind of the pomp and circumstance and so on, it's all very important in terms of the way the Chinese consumer perceives us. Um, uh, David Cameron took uh, Xi Jinping to a local pub, traditional, drank a traditional drink of beer, and um, this company, Green, Green King, uh, is their IPA beer, it, it's, had, its sales increased by over 1,000% overnight from uh, people coming onto their website and ordering just because of this one photo that was broadcast in Chinese media. So, um, you know, really tapping into that is very important. And actually some of the successes that we've seen with British brands is being led by key opinion leaders, going uh, on, on the various platforms, Weibo, uh, WeChat, etc., uh, tweeting, blogging about uh, British products. And that's a very good way to uh, kind of build awareness in China. And obviously tourism as well, the inbound tourism, 200,000 visitors to the UK each year, Again, it's not helped by the fact that we're not part of the Schengen visa arrangement, but we are still seeing uh, significant growth. So that's an important touch point, I think, in terms of driving the broader e-commerce opportunity. So who, who are actually selling in China? Um, we're seeing more UK brands selling in China. So the, the big high street names, the likes of um, the luxury brands like Burberry, but also high street fashion, often, often increasingly having stores in China as well. Um, also, the opening up of cross-border e-commerce means that we're beginning to see more in other categories, food and drink, mother and baby, health and beauty in particular. Um, the kind of the, um, the lowering of the sort of regulatory um, requirements on, for example, food and drink and, and cosmetics is making it a little bit easier for smaller UK brands to access the market. Uh, whereas maybe five years ago it would have required a huge amount of investment and a huge element of risk uh, in order to break into the market. I think that for a lot of these brands, they're still testing China. Um, how many of them are actually making a profit from the China market um, is another question. But, but certainly the, the kind of uh, um, cross-channel approach to um, China and actually Platforms like Tmall and JD.com can be a very important way to drive business outside of China as well. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole myriad of challenges that companies face when it comes, uh, when it comes to China. We've heard about, uh, from iClick about the importance of data um, in, in terms of driving um, decisions. Uh, issues like, uh, you know, Collecting consumer insights, how do you do that as a small business that has no feet on the ground in China? Collecting data, so selling via marketplaces is obviously a great way to collect data uh, in terms of selecting which SKUs to offer in China, what type of products, what colours, what sizes, etc. And there's been many cases, Marks and Spencer's probably being the, the, the best example of companies that have just gone into China and Full, full throttle without really thinking about what it is that the China, Chinese consumer wants to buy and where it sits in the, in the marketplace. Um, clearly linked to that is strategy development, so choosing the right platform to sell through. Um, thinking about um, whether or not you need to do that through a local partner. Um, what the kind of pros and cons are of the, the channel strategy that, that, that you're adopting. And ultimately, um, you know, finding the right business model for you, because for, for every British brand that we talk to, uh, they're facing different challenges in terms of, um, in terms of market access. Um, so understanding re legal and regulatory issues is, is also very important. I think next week, 
um, we, we'll, we will see the new tax laws come into force on cross-border e-commerce. So duty, duty rates are, are changing. Uh, so businesses really also need to understand um, from a pricing perspective what their landed cost is going to be into the hands of the Chinese consumer, whether it makes sense to sell via a more traditional B to B to C route, or whether sell initially maybe testing the market by going cross-border direct to the consumer. Um, I don't think there's any right and wrong answers to this, and you know China's constantly in a state of flux. E-commerce, cross-border e-commerce is developing and changing on, almost on a weekly basis. Um, so there's a, whole, uh, there's a whole learning experience that companies have to go through in order to understand what the right approach to the market should be. Um, we've seen the opening up of, um, as well as selling direct and establishing um, your own store on, on the e-marketplace, the cross-border e-marketplaces, we've also seen the development of curated stores such as the Royal Mail has opened a Timor store which is a multi-brand store. It sells everything from milk powder through to fold-up bikes and, and, and a whole lot in between. Um, another one recently established on uh, JD World, uh, Worldwide, which is a curated uh, fashion store, mainly targeting gentlemen's fashion. Uh, obviously, in the UK, we have a lot of heritage brands uh, for gentlemen and for ladies um, that are increasingly popular in China. So this is kind of a low commitment, low-cost way to enter the market in that you don't necessarily have to put a huge deposit down and invest in your own marketing. You're able to sort of hang on the coattails of other brands that maybe have a, uh, already have a following in China. Um, we have our own case study here today, so I don't want to dwell too much on the case studies. Um, and we heard a lot of this from uh, Clarence anyway, but obviously a company like Burberry, of Burberry's resource, is able to invest in building a truly omnichannel strategy in China. And it's been very successful in utilising all of the various channels, uh, running, having partnerships with WeChat, running um, WeChat campaigns over uh, Spring Festival, um, really linking together all of, their, um, all of their different platforms. And seeing Tmall not necessarily as important in itself as a sales channel, but actually utilising it as a marketing tool to drive traffic into their overseas stores, drive them into London, into Hong Kong, into Vista Village shopping experience, um, and actually linking all those things together. Um, other examples, uh, maybe a less uh, familiar brand, a company called Tangle Teaser, um, which makes hairbrushes for ladies, uh, I suppose gentlemen or ladies, that uh, untangle your hair. Um, uh, without, without pulling your hair. Um, so if you, if, if you have curly hair, please go and check it out, it's amazing. Um, this brand, um, it was a startup company, they set up I think in 2008, um, and they were mainly selling offline in China through um, health and beauty uh, hair salons and through uh, personal care stores. Um, what happened was a, ch a famous Chinese model uh, whose name escapes me, went into a store on, on Oxford Street, I think, and bought this product, thought it was amazing, went onto Weibo, uh, tweeted about it, and within a week they were getting hundreds of orders from China that escalated into thousands, and um, suddenly they had lots of Taobao resellers selling their products in China, and before they knew it, half their sales were coming from China without even stepping foot on Chinese soil. Um, it illustrates just the power of social media, but also how a small company that doesn't have brand awareness can build, build a strong business in China. Um, you need a bit of uh, fortune, and you need to have the right product, but it is possible. And actually, Tangle Teaser now, you know, they're, they're, they're selling on most of the major platforms in China, from Tmall through to JD.com. Um, they, I think it accounts for the majority of their, of their sales. And um, you know they're now valued at, at sort of a, it being a multi-billion, uh, multi-million um, uh, uh, euro company. Um, so they've grown hugely on the back of it. Um, I won't really uh, get. I think that's probably it for me. I'm going to hand over to, to um, Jackie from Base Formula. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me about um, uh, afterwards, I'd be very happy to speak to you. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, I suppose I am the case study of a small medium company that's been brought over from the UK to try and tell their China story. Um, we have quite an interesting China story, so I know lunch is uh, not very far away. Um, I'll try and keep it brief, but hopefully it'll be interesting. Um, Base Formula is uh, 20 years old. Um, we were established in 1996. Um, it, is, it was a B2B, principally a B2B uh, entity founded by Chris and Karen Keating. Um, its objective was to supply um, <coughs> aromatherapy essentials and sundries to therapists and spas, principally in the UK. And it did that quite successfully on a very small scale for about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> and then there were a couple of interesting things happened. Uh, about five years ago, the online store started to have uh, an increase in number of orders. Um, and uh, one of the girls in the office said, um, they're Chinese people who are buying our products. Oh, I think they're Chinese students. And he said, why, why is that? She said, well, they've all got room numbers, and they're all in Birmingham or Manchester or London, so I think, I think we've got quite a lot of Chinese students interested in our products. And indeed, that has proved to be the case. Um, they found these. They were making these. And they told all their friends. And we had absolutely no idea no idea at all what was going on. Um, we had also been approached by uh, a Chinese individual who was interested in uh, taking the brand to China. And at that time, as a small B2B, we said, OK, fine, off you go. Uh, we set some targets and off he went. And um, we ended up in a situation where we were a very small B2B enterprise, now trying to develop a B2C business model but the C wasn't just a, cu a cu customer, it was a Chinese customer. So we've been trying to develop a more retail oriented approach um, to the UK online market. Uh, um, sorry, in the market. And we found ourselves trading in China. So you then find that there are a number of challenges that you weren't necessarily anticipating suddenly land on your door. Um, the brand obviously is based Formula. Uh, we received a letter from an individual who said that uh, they actually owned the IP for Base <coughs> Formula in the PRC uh, in the class that we wanted to trade in. And uh, so we had to make a quick change. Uh, we'd been doing some uh, brand development work and we'd fortunately, the uh, small logo mark on the right hand side uh, is um, BFM Therapy, which is now the brand that we use to trade in China. We were quite fortunate in the sense that Chinese customers referred to base formula as BF. So we were able to make that transition quite quickly. But also another learning that we had was that in China, uh, you're not necessarily known by your own name. You can sometimes be given a pet name, and our pet name was Fang Chang Shi, uh, which we now own the registration for. So we had to go through a process of registering our IP in China, um, and we have done that um, obviously internationally. Um, the next issue that we came across uh, was that um, we had an issue with the distributor. The distributor had uh, registered the uh, bsformula.com.cn on the left-hand side. Uh, so uh, we were no longer able to use that in China as our um, online, platform, the online platform. It's an information site, it's not an e-commerce platform. Uh, so we had to start again and set up our own. And because we still don't own the base formula IP, uh, there's nothing we can do about that at the moment. Um, in the UK, um, as we've been developing the brand, we've tried to retain a professional, um, an impression of a protect professional history of the brand, giving confidence and expertise in, uh, in the aromatherapy sector. And we're aiming to give a clean, natural look and feel to the brand image. And this is actually our new site. Um, uh, for training for 20 years, we thought we'd give ourselves a birthday present. 
Um, it's not launched yet. Um, every day is the day it will be launched. I'm hoping it will be in the next couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to illustrate um, the difference between how a brand can uh, is treated between different platforms. So, so the previous slide is how we try to project our brand and operate in, in the UK on our dot-com platform. Um, this is our Timor Global Store, um, which we operate through a TP. And you can see immediately, we're not able to exercise the same level of uh, control around the brand iteration that we might like. Um, it, it's being adapted for a local market. Um, and this continues. Uh, we have, a, on the, in B2B platforms, we have a trading relationship with Jume. Um, and again, you can see from here that the... It, the, uh, the projection of the brand isn't necessarily how we would ideally like. This is a lot better than it used to be. Um, and the more platforms that you operate with, the increased variety of uh, brand projection you, you will find. And I think, I think principally this is as a consequence of being an SME. We don't have as much power and control over how we'd like our brand uh, to be promoted um, so in terms of our cross-border platforms, um, we've been learning quite a lot about um, the Chinese market and uh, the, the, the challenges that uh, have been brought to bear within that. Um, content is king. Um, I actually started uh, my first exposure with uh, an e-commerce uh, company 10 years ago and uh, the founder's mantra was content is king. And it's something that I've brought with me uh, all the way through. As a brand, we've worked very hard over the last five years to develop um, professional, reliable and interesting content. Um, we have a very diligent brand marketing manager um, and we work with a team of room therapists and we create, we've created a vast library of articles, blogs, recipes, blends for our customers. We engage with our therapists. Um, we have a lot of content. So we think we're quite good at it. Uh, we're learning. So this is our uh, Timor Global platform and this is our uh, number one best-selling product and I'm hoping that this is going to work. It should illustrate for you just how much product information we've had to create is this bit particularly. The way that the the product is illustrated, the focus on the... Oh, it's disappeared. <laughs> there should be a focus on ingredients, on uh, packaging, the benefits of the ingredients. I don't know if I press it again, what's going to happen? Oh. Have I broken it? Okay. So, again, you can see there's a lot of context. <laughs> Um, there's actually three cuts to this page. I'm going to use the same page and I've just cut it uh, to try and break it up a bit. So here you see the product and then it stops again. Well, I don't know. Do you think it's going to work or not? Well, so the bit at the bottom isn't. Well, unfortunately, the bit that I wanted to show you isn't coming up. Um, there's an awful lot of photography, there's an awful lot of emphasis on it, the ingredients, um, information about the brand, information about the packaging. Um, and what I wanted to show here is we're learning about that, so we're trying to reflect that back on our own site. So this is a page taken from our new site where we're looking at ingredients and looking at how we might be able to illustrate that information much better than the first slide you saw, which was re it's really good content, but it's just lots of words. Um, customer engagement, um, there are lots of people in the room who are far more digitally aware and capable uh, than I am, uh, but one of the things that is very important for us to have learned or we are learning about Chinese customers is uh, customer engagement is very important, um, their feedback is critical, what they say about the brand and where they say it uh, is fundamental to our success. Um, 
on our on our site at home yes we do this we encourage customers to give us feedback we are active on social media um, we do like to hear what customers have to say about our products and how they use them and we do encourage that um, again I'm hoping for a comparison it may be so and here's some Chinese customers again illustrating the the number one product on uh, the Timor Global platform and I'm hoping that it will illustrate the content that is required, there's information about the, the company, there's information, validation about the brand, uh, and there's lots of other things that you can't see because the slide's not working, sorry. Um, and the next one, hopefully, we'll try this one. If this gets to the end, this would be really helpful because at the bottom here, it illustrates how critical it is for the for us to uh, f for the brand store in on Timon to have the customer feedback. <coughs> they they send us comments, they send pictures, and they ask lots and lots of questions. I'm really sorry. It, it would be really good if you could see just how much feedback there there is on a single product and how it is. Um, fed into the Timor store. Ultimately, their feedback determines the success of our store, and all of those, all of that information is just one page, just one product page. And so, for us, we're we're only a small company. We're having to learn about how we uh, protect the brand in China, the requirements of Chinese customers, the investment that we're having to make in all of this content and information that's required just to open our Timor Timor Global Brand Store which has been open now for about 10 months, I think. And so for us as a brand, um, the next challenge is really to uh, start to develop our brand voice online in China. So uh, in terms of social media, we have, uh, we have a profile on Weibo. It's not particularly impressive. Uh, we haven't uh, started, um, we haven't activated on WeChat at all as yet. We don't have the resource within the business to be able to support the requirements of customer engagement um, in that platform. Uh, we have, uh, we're just about to uh, start work with a social uh, digital marketing agency to try to help us to move that aspect of our, our brand forward. So, um, I suppose if I wanted to, it, all my pictures have gone. Um, uh, to um, to summarise, really, I think f from our point of view, the things that I have learned most, are, we need to be prepared. Um, the IP registration is is paramount. Um, trading with China, there is lots of documentation, there are lots of contracts, there is one-time contracts, there are 12-month contracts, there are five-year contracts. Content, the investment in content is massive. The costs of setting up and running a, 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 a global platform, a team global, global store, are significant. The resource required to support it is huge. Um, patience, why are we still doing it? It takes a huge amount of time. The majority of our customers are Chinese. It's very important to us to try to get this right. Um, it is very different, and it takes time to understand how and why the, the market is different. Uh, we've learned to be very flexible. Our way is not necessarily the only way, and it's not the right way either. Um, and for us, I think probably the, the most important thing is we we have maintained our commitment to trying to understand and develop our brand for the Chinese consumer. Um, there are too many challenges to enter the Chinese market half-heartedly. Um, and I hope that you found that quite interesting. And I'm really sorry that my staff, I worked so hard.